All right, space fans, this one's for you. NASA is now one giant leap closer to sending humans back to the moon as the Orion spacecraft successfully completed its mission. Now, flight engineers using a so-called skip entry, where the spacecraft, traveling at 25,000 miles per hour, hits Earth's atmosphere, skipping off it like a rock on a lake. I'm sure many of you watched the Orion splashdown, but what's with this skip entry we keep hearing about? Well, Orion is unique because it created the first ever skip entry for a human-rated spacecraft. Basically, this is going to keep the astronauts more comfortable when they return home. Think about it like skipping a stone on a pond. The entry takes about 20 minutes. First, Orion encounters the atmosphere, and then you have the skip. Then Orion starts to gain altitude again and rejects some of that heat back out to space, making the second entry slower. Of course, we want a gentle landing in the ocean, so this is achieved by dissipating that energy. Skip entry improves crew safety by giving us a consistent, predictable, repeatable landing target. That brings the crew closer to recovery forces and it minimizes the time for their safe recovery. Skip entry enabled Orion to travel over 5,000 miles to a precise landing target. And did you know that Apollo had this capability, but they skipped it? Wow. <laughs> This may be the first skip entry for a spacecraft built for humans, but this is definitely not the first time we've seen this maneuver be used. This is not a new thing. In fact, the Soviet Zon probes, which were Soyuz spaceships without people on board, did this in the 60s. And even the Apollos did a little bit of a one. They didn't really do a double re-entry, mm -hmm. but they came down to 50 kilometers, then went back up to 65 and then down. So they did do this sort of roller coaster move just a much gentler one. So why would you do that? It reduces the G-forces on the re-entry, so it's a bit gentler for the astronauts. But for Orion, one of the most important things is it lets you control fairly accurately your splashdown location, and it lets you change the splashdown location. So, you know, three days, four days before splashdown, they did the departure burn for the moon. And at that point, they're basically committed to the point at which they hit the atmosphere. You cannot change where the other end of that orbit is going to be by much. A couple right. of course corrections, but, but pretty much you're going to hit the atmosphere at a particular time and place. And if the weather's bad there, you're going to be out of luck, right? right. And so with the skip re-entry, the exact last minute changes you make to the entry angle determine how much of a skip you make. And so they were able the day before landing to adjust the angle from what they planned to change the final splashdown location by a couple hundred miles. Okay. Oh, right, wow. to avoid to avoid bad weather. And so you can't go left or right. There's a, there's a line you're going along, north south, basically. And uh, they're going for, they were coming in from Antarctica over the Pacific, up past South America towards uh, Mexico and the US. And the choice they had is along that line, where do you splash? Mm -hmm. And so by making a steeper or a more shallower uh, skip, you can adjust exactly where that final splash is very easily at the very last minute. How does it skip? It doesn't have wings, right? But the, the bottom surface of the capsule is shaped in such a way that there is a lift. Okay. And oh, so it's wow. like a kind of a wing, even though it does not shape like a wing. Uh, and so by changing the angle, you get different amounts of lift and, uh, and that lets it skip in a very thin upper atmosphere, right? Um, yeah. and, and so you're sort of belly flopping on the atmosphere. <laughs> And, and bouncing off it. And uh, so you do a little bounce and then plop back in. Still, while this is an impressive engineering feat, some believe that SLS is just not sustainable. So Artemis One is now complete. They've got it back on the earth. Phew, after so many years and so many gigabucks, it, it, it is, you know, it would have been really bad if it hadn't worked, right? And and so, yeah, if you throw enough money at old space approaches, it can deliver something really amazing. Uh, and, and so good for them, good for the engineers who did a great job. 
the system is not sustainable, I think is the problem. And, and you know, at so many billion dollars a shot and the flight rate looks like it's going to be one every two or three years, they've got to depend on Starship anyway for the lander, it looks like, because of the they don't have enough right. funding to develop a separate lander. So the next flight, right, Artemis II, allegedly 2024, much more likely 2025, I suspect, uh, will send a few astronauts on a loop around the moon, Apollo 13 style, not even in orbit, right? Just loop around the moon and come back. Right. Um, and, you know, that's another decent test flight, and it would be perfectly reasonable if it were happening three months after Artemis I. Why is it going to take so long in between? Because I've had some viewers ask me, why can't they just, you know, go? Roll another one out? Well, I haven't finished. Really. I mean, because the funding required to do more of these things in parallel, mm -hmm. right? You'd need to double facilities and it's not just adding a few more engineers. You'd need a lot more money uh, and it's already a large load of money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and so um uh and they are yeah i mean you know they're just very deliberate and and uh, do a lot of testing um and they do not believe in the in their spacex approach of build another couple blow a few of them up <laughs> you know yes. they, they want everyone to work perfectly the first time and so that is uh um uh and and that means expensive and slow yeah i mean are you even excited about sls and not really because i think that that it, it's it's uh you know i'm excited i mean it's an impressive technical achievement right um but again it's never going to be launching frequently enough yeah to have an to be an interesting expansion of humanity into the solar system maybe maybe it's all we've got maybe starship will never work and this and the long march nine will be the way that humanity goes through the solar system and it will take a very long time uh and uh, uh you know so be it but uh if spacex can get starship to work mm -hmm. then pretty quickly i think sls becomes obsolete and will yeah will be do you imagined. think they obviously have two, three, four, five planned, but do you even think we'll get to Artemis five? I, I just feel like it's it's questionable. I, I I would guess Artemis five is about right. Artemis okay. six gets dubious, right? Gotcha. It, it's, I think it will take a while for the politics to work its way through because largely, you know, to to some significant extent at least, SLS and Artemis are a jobs program mm -hmm. for yeah. Boeing and Northrop Grumman and these other big classic aerospace companies. And as long as they are providing jobs in those states, those senators will push for it to continue to be supported. You say it's an impressive engineering feat, but my understanding is a lot of it is kind of old technology. So what is the most impressive thing about it? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, putting that those old components together in a new way. Yeah. Um, uh, but it is, I mean, certainly, you know, it's been 50 years since we, you know, 50 years this week, I guess, since we yes. last sent humans to the moon. And so, you know, none of the people working at NASA now pretty much, are, you know, ha had have sent humans to the moon. And so even if it's all written down, right, just because you're, you know, just because your mom and dad did something 50 years ago and told you about it doesn't make you know how to do it. Right. right right and so learning to do it again is a process you know that's going well so far let's see how it goes with humans there's so much more software involved in this than there was in the apollo saturn right mm -hmm. um and so the fact that that software worked well is good news anytime you build a rocket that big i guess it's impressive when it flies and doesn't blow up right so <laughs> so i'm glad for that but 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 in terms of you know on a historic scale um it's yeah i'm not sure how how significant it really is going to be so how long do you think we'll see artemis missions do you think that we will get all the way to artemis 5 leave your predictions below in the comments also i'm so excited for my new hoodie design to get here so i can show you guys but i'll show you guys in this picture 
I just teamed up with Tony Bella. He helped create my logo as well as the logo for Marcus House. And we've created this pretty awesome sweatshirt to celebrate Starship and of course, rapid iteration. So if you are interested in ordering this as a gift, I will leave that link in the description. All of your support, whether it is through Patreon or ordering merchandise, or even just a simple like and comment on this video, really help Ellie and Space to continue to grow. And I'm so looking forward to the new year and growing the channel even more. So thank you so much for everyone who watches Ellie in Space. I'll see you in the next video.